cardiovascular medicine in general is just fascinating because um, horses' hearts make a whole range of strange sounds and strange, strange rhythms, and trying to understand what's going on is, is a real challenge. So they, they're fundamentally interested, but, but changes over such a huge, wide range of exercise that it, it's endlessly fascinating. Um, the more I find out, the more I realize I don't know very much, but it's absolutely fascinating. And the particular area of research we're working in, um, it's become pretty apparent over the years that we don't have a very good idea of what normal is. Um, every time somebody comes along with a problem or we, we identify something abnormal, uh, then we have a challenge to say whether this really is abnormal. And I keep running up against the question, we don't know what normal is. The current research into heart rhythm issues does have a, um, an economic component. There's an obvious welfare and safety component. But the economic component relates to such things at one extreme as a horse that's got a rhythm disturbance losing economic value because there's worry about the heart goes through horses that are that have no welfare issue and are perfectly happy themselves but who can't work and there's obviously an economic impact there they can't work then they have limited value uh, right through to the other extreme where the actual sudden loss of a horse with a rhythm disturbance is a huge issue and when clients bring horses to us they're looking for some reassurance and they're also looking, if possible, for, uh, for a fix to the problem. Um, and so even after we've discussed safety issues and, uh, and welfare issues, um, there's a need somewhere to put an, an economic value on the significance. I leave that to the client to decide, but I try to give them the information that they can use to decide what the economic impact is going to be. They may already know that very well. And obviously, I don't need to comment on the economic impact of a sudden death. But there are a whole range of economic issues associated with rhythm disturbances and cardiac disease in general. One of the uh, um, treatments that Dr. McGurn and I worked on in the last uh, few years has been in treatment for atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation is probably the most common clinically significant rhythm disturbance that horses have. And they can live with it for a long, happy life if they're not supposed to work. But if they're supposed to work, or if there's potential for them being resold, um, then there is an issue and it needs to be fixed. And it, now we realize it can be fixed, even in horses that have had the problem for a long time. So we routinely treat horses with atrial fibrillation now in this hospital with uh, what's called transvenous electrical cardioversion. And this is the project that uh, Kim McGurnan worked on for her graduate uh, program and now applies routinely. It's basically her technique. Um, we pass electrodes into the heart and we deliver an electric shock under anesthesia um, to the horse's heart and convert the rhythm to normal. And at this point, um, I think Kim's total procedure number right now is around 170. And uh, we have a 100% response rate. Um, it's not a, um, a magic bullet. We can't treat them with this and expect them never get in trouble again. Um, some of these horses, about 20%, will relapse at some point into the arrhythmia again. Um, but we have had some horses who have been treated three or four times with good periods of productivity in between. But the prognosis for the horse is no different whether you treat them with the electrical treatment or with regular drugs and the long-term prognosis. This is simply another way of converting them. And it's a way to convert horses to a normal heart rhythm who otherwise would not be treatable because they can't tolerate the drug, for example. So this has been very, very successful. Um, in terms of major breakthroughs um, after the atrial fibrillation the treatment, um, probably the most significant thing uh, in the last few years has been to identify, in this case in racing standard breads, that around 18% of horses develop serious ventricular rhythm disturbances in the uh, cool down period after exercise. But I have to emphasize we haven't yet proven that the horses that are dropping dead um, are experiencing that sort of rhythm disturbance. And so that's led to the current study at uh, the thoroughbred racetrack. We're now doing the same thing we did with the standard breads. We're putting monitoring devices on horses actually during regularly scheduled races. And once again, we, we hope we don't see any horses getting into trouble, but we are interested to see uh, whether in fact they experience the same sort of disturbances in rhythm. It'll just be more evidence uh, as to this being a possible cause of sudden death. I think that's really significant. It's really, really interesting. 
one of the big differences with the thoroughbred study from the compared with the standard bread study is that we could use many standard pieces of equipment to carry out the study. So processing the data was an issue pr principally of volume of data. The study is actually halfway through. We completed phase one in the fall and got about half of the horses. Now we need to c complete the second phase of the study. The reason it's in two phases is because we have to make sure that some of the data are collected during very hot and humid weather. And that wasn't going to be happening in September or October. One of the really challenging aspects of this research, which is also very stimulating, is that it's, it's multidisciplinary. Um, we're not just collecting ECG signals. Um, we have to build the uh, uh, circuits. We have to build the ECG collection equipment. We have to design circuits. We have to spec uh, data collection devices. We have to get heavily into, into, into the data collection theory, the digital sampling theory, to collect the data. And then we have to become very proficient at analyzing the data, which involves several steps of, uh, of filtering. And we have to write a lot of the software ourselves to make sure that we can get it done, because none of this stuff exists on the shelves. And most of the human software, excellent as it is for humans, doesn't recognize horses' ECGs properly. So there's a lot of uh, ground level equipment uh, and, and, and simple physics and engineering that has to go into it. Well, what is an ECG? The heart is actually a big bag of muscle. It's a pretty important bag of muscle, but it really is simply a bag of muscle. It's a pump. Um, and it's a slave pump. It simply does what the system tells it. And as all muscles do, they contract by virtue of receiving an electrical signal. And that electrical signal causes all of the heart muscle to contract. And as the muscle contracts, it itself generates electricity. And some of that electricity is actually strong enough to get across the chest wall and get to the skin surface. So if we put leads, uh, wires, onto the horse's chest, we can measure the potential difference or the voltage between two points and, and plot that onto a piece of paper. And that voltage pattern, or that electrical pattern, is called an electrocardiogram, or, or short form, an ECG. And because every contraction is associated with that electrical activity, we can use that to monitor the horse's heart rhythm. Our research is funded primarily by Equine Guelph, uh, who in turn receive funding to support the fund from a, a number of uh, outside groups. We have also received funding from the Grayson Jockey Club Foundation, um, and further funding has come from OMAFRA, from the government, provincial government. We have uh, applications also in for funding from to other external agencies, and we have also received some monies by, uh, by private agreement from private supporters, but mostly from Equine Guelph. And uh, most of the research to this point has been done between Dr. McGurin and I, and Dr. McGurin does the bulk of the clinical service in the hospital. Um, the current pro project I'm working on myself, and that was funded by Equine Guelph. We, re we also receive very significant support in kind from the industry all the way from the horsemen and women who participate in our studies, whether it's by holding a horse for us or letting us collect data from their horses, through groups like uh, Woodbine Entertainment Group, who provide us access to their facilities, um, even the security people on the gate who get to know us and, uh, and check us out, always check us out, but check us out relatively rapidly because they know what we're up to. We can come and go collecting our data. We have support from outfits like Standard Red Canada, who have been tremendously supportive over the last 25 years in giving us access to the information we need to carry out the research. So, as always, um, it's a huge bunch of people. And probably among the unsung heroes of getting research done are the summer students. These are undergraduate students who come and work for us. I have four with me right now, and they do a wonderful job. And uh, they're so sharp and they're so keen, so a lot has to do with their ingenuity and their energy. They are very, very important in the task as well. So it's multiple people, and in a place like this, you don't do anything on your own.